Well, I am especially pleased today to be introducing our presenter, John Jonas, who will be speaking uh, uh, to us today on the topic of celestial navigation, a topic I'm sure we're all very conversant with. And the title of his talk is Standing on the Shoulders of Giants. Uh, by way of quick reminder, uh, John and his wife Jody and son Jacob moved to Boulder in 2017. They were in Singapore for almost 20 years. They've become very involved in the community since they came here, and I think it is a wonderful coincidence that the occurrence of his presentation to us today marks the one-year anniversary of John's joining Rotary, and I'm very pleased uh, that I was his sponsor, so thank you, John. Uh, what I more recently learned is that John successfully earned the designation of Yacht Master from the Royal Yachting Association, and he did that to be prepared for his planned sailing trip from Newport, Rhode Island to Auckland, New Zealand upon his son's graduation from high school. It occurs to me that Mike is still going to expect you to participate in meetings uh, during your voyage, so make sure you've got tele uh, some satellites working for you. John's talk today provides a wonderful blend of what celestial navigation is and how it's done, but equally importantly, the story of the extraordinary accomplishment of mankind in the uh, development of the science, of the movement of the bodies in the universe, and the development of the equipment and methods to use that knowledge to create the ability for navigators centuries ago to safely sail the seas and for astro-navigators today to conduct successful uh, missions in space. Thank you, John, for offering to talk to us today. Okay, thank you, Paul, for that very nice introduction. I appreciate that. Uh, before we start, um, could I see a show of hands how many people have used celestial navigation to find their position at sea? One, two, three, three four. Okay, good. How many people have not used that? <laughs> All right, so I've got a few people to, here to fact check me, so I'll try to be careful. Um, I don't have any great social justice message or call to action. Uh, this uh, is something that I learned a few years ago. I found it really interesting, and so uh, I thought uh, many of you here might find it interesting as well. So. Um, I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about my, my sailing background and, um, and sort of how I came to be here today. Uh, what, Paul touched on my plan. I'll go into a little bit more details on what that, what that entails. And then some of the training that I undertook to realize that plan. And as I was doing this training, just this realization of like these really clever people that came before us. And like for me, I'm a pretty clever guy, I think of myself, and it was hard to learn this. And then when I think about the people who figured this out in the first place, it's just jaw dropping. And, you know, and we sort of stand on the shoulders of giants every day, whether it's through our technology or through whatever, but uh, it's just, uh, it was, for me, it was very fun to learn about. And then uh, a, a brief status of where, uh, where we are today. So uh, as far as sailing goes, uh, I love all kinds of sailing. This is me windsurfing in South Texas where I met my wife, Jody. Uh, this is uh, late last year in St. Lucia on a bear boat trip. So whether it's sort of on a, catamaran in the Caribbean or on a sunfish on a little pond or windsurfing. I've just always really liked sailing. Uh, I started a long time ago when I was just real little. Uh, that's me there at the helm and uh, my mom and sister Kim. Hi mom. Hi Kim. And uh, you know looking very serious and making sure I'm uh, doing the right thing there. And it was actually on this boat uh, where 
uh, as I got a little bit older into high school, I came up with this great plan, and I told my dad one day, hey, uh, my, buddy is, my buddy's in a, and we're going to go, and we're going to sail from Rhode Island to Newport after I graduate high school. And so keep in mind, this is you know, long before GPS. We didn't have a Loran. Uh, the only navigation equipment I, we had on the boat was that compass you see there at the helm. Um, fortunately, my dad put the kibosh on that. Uh, the odds of us actually being able to make Bermuda and crossing the Gulf Stream with no navigational aids were pretty close to zero. I'm sure we'd still be floating around the Atlantic right now. But the, the idea of that trip sort of just stuck with me. And, um, and so later, I said, well, you know, I, I never did that high school trip, so I'm going to do something a little different. And so I came up with this modified plan <laughs> where I was still going to go to Bermuda, starting in Rhode Island and still go to Bermuda, uh, but then sort of continue down the east coast of the U.S. Uh, through the Bahamas and spend some time in the Caribbean, um, make my way through the canal, uh, check out the Galapagos, I've never been there, I've always wanted to go. Uh, and then sort of do this very unplanned boondoggle of, you know, visiting different islands in the South Pacific. And, uh, you know, I don't know how long it'll take, maybe two years. Um, so this was sort of the modified plan. So fast forward a little bit more, um, I get a little bit older, a little bit wiser and smarter. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> And it was on this trip, actually, uh, in just offshore Tonga. And the, the friend who was sailing with me, he, at one point in the trip, he turns to me and he says, you don't know anything about sailing. And I was like, what do you mean? Let me show you these pictures. I've been sailing since I was a little kid. But then when I started thinking about it, he was dead right. I knew very little about sailing. I had some practical knowledge, but I had, I had nothing, basically. So I started to think, all right, how am I going to get this knowledge? Um, in the US, uh, there's something called the American Sailing Academy or Association, uh, the ASA. And a lot of sailors use that here, but internationally, it's not very well recognized. Uh, so I. I actually did all my training through the Royal Yachting Association, as Paul uh, mentioned earlier. And a uh, fantastic program. Uh, if anybody is interested in learning more about sailing, I'd highly recommend their courses. Um, one of the aspects of the training was astro-navigation. And so we all know astro-navigation starts with a sextant. And Jim, thank you very much for showing around the sextant during lunch. Uh, if anybody would like to see it and didn't get a chance during lunch, I have it up here, and I'd be happy to show you after, after today's program. But it's a pretty simple device. Um, it just shows you the angle of a celestial object um, relative to the horizon. And so you look through this telescope here, and the first thing you hit is this partially reflective mirror. So you can sort of half see through, and it's half reflective. So the part you look through, you line that up with the horizon. And then the mirrored part uh, lines up with the celestial object. And you adjust this index bar here, and then you look at how many degrees it is off the horizon, and now you know uh, the height of that object off the horizon. So it's a really simple device. It's been around for a long time. So we use the sextant to find latitude and longitude. So latitude is the easy one. And navigators have known how to find latitude for many hundreds of years. And um, so we know from our elementary school education, Lines of latitude run east-west. They're parallel to each other. Uh, we have a famous line of latitude here in Boulder. It's the 40th parallel. Uh, does anybody know where that is? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Wasn't expecting that, but okay. 
Yeah, so baseline road was the baseline that the surveyors used to measure distances north and south uh, during the 1850s and 60s when the surveyors were all running around here trying to uh, show where everybody's gold claim was. So with just the sextant, we don't need a clock or anything, but with just the sextant, we can determine our latitude by doing a noon sight on the sun. And when you look through the sextant with the filters down, that's what it actually looks like when you look through the telescope. It's just sort of a green circle sitting on the horizon. And if we apply some pretty easy math, uh, just some addition and subtraction here, uh, we can actually watch through the sextant as the sun climbs up in the sky. And then you'll see it pause for just that tiny three seconds maybe and then it starts coming back down. And so right at the pause, you know, we're following it with our sextant. Right when it pauses, then we look and we see what the, what the altitude was, this observed altitude of the sun at that time. We do a little bit of math and we know our latitude. And this has been known for a long time. Longitude uh, is a little bit harder. Um, so we're going to get a little bit into the weeds here, so stick with me. Um, when we talk about longitude, we need a few more things. Uh, the first thing uh, to talk about longitude is the nautical almanac. So I'm going to read this to you because it's just so cool. Uh, the nautical almanac, it gives us the position of the sun, the moon, four different planets, and 57 different stars at any hour, on any day of the year, from any point on the planet. I mean, <laughs> that's just amazing to me. And so it was first published in 1767 uh, in England. Uh, it's published annually every year by the US Naval Observatory uh, in collaboration with the Brits. Uh, you can also get a perpetual almanac uh, which is what this is. Uh, perpetual because the sun and stars, they repeat every four years. And uh, the planets follow a more complicated uh, orbit path, but sun and stars every four years. And so from now to the end of time, you can tell where you are on the face of the earth with this little book about the size of a magazine. Just awesome. So this is what it looks like. Uh, don't worry, I'll zoom in in a sec. Um, each page is a different day, actually three days. And uh, this is today's page, by the way. This is March 1st, 2019. So it's a Friday. Uh, this is the position of the sun on today. The time is 1 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, which is 20 hundred hours uh, Greenwich Mean Time. So right now, the sun is at 116 degrees west of Greenwich, England. Boulder's longitude is 105 degrees. And so, yeah, it makes sense that the sun would have recently passed over our head, you know, sometime in the last hour. So that sort of makes sense. This is essentially the latitude of the sun right now. Uh, it tells us that the sun is in the southern hemisphere, uh, negative seven or seven degrees south. And that makes sense too, because we're in winter, we're getting close to spring, the spring equinox is when the sun is right at the equator. So, now we know where we are, right? Um, no. So, so we use the almanac to calculate the height of an object. And so that tells us something, um, but not the whole picture. So let's say that's the sun, and we've just shot the sun with our sextant, and we have a reading of 70 degrees. So it's 70 degrees from this point on planet Earth. But it's also 70 degrees from this point. And it's also from this point. So we call it a line of position, but it's actually a circle of position. And because the distances are so great, the circle is a pretty big circle. So when we do a sun sight, we, get, we know we're somewhere on this line, but we don't know where. 
So you need another piece of the puzzle to figure it out. During the day, uh, we're somewhat limited. Sometimes we can see the moon during the day. At night, we can shoot planets and stars and all sorts of things, and we can take six or seven uh, shootings and get a real accurate uh, estimate of where we are. But even with two sites, we still don't know whether we're south of Hawaii or north of Hawaii, but that's 3,000 miles apart. You probably have a good idea of which of those two positions uh, that you're at. So that's longitude, a little bit harder than latitude. One of the things that makes longitude really hard is the time factor. Remember when we looked at the table over here and we saw that it was 2,000 hours GMT? Well, if you don't know that it's 2,000 hours GMT, then the nautical almanac is no use to you. You have to know exactly what time of day it is. And around the time of the early European explorers, the most accurate clocks that they had were pendulum clocks, which were pretty good. Um, but as soon as you put a pendulum clock on a ship that's rocking back and forth, not so good. So uh, along comes the invention of the chronometer. A chronometer is just a fancy name for a really accurate clock that you can cross-reference with the nautical almanac. And we'll touch on the chronometer again in my closing remarks. So how accurate does it have to be? Well, the sun is racing pretty fast across the planet uh, to the tune of about one nautical mile every four seconds. So if your clock is even off by one or two seconds a day and you're out for a multi-month journey, it doesn't take very long for the error to really creep in and then you have no idea where you are. So it's got to be spot on. Let's just talk about the pain of getting it wrong. Um, so let's say we start in the Galapagos and our destination is the Marquesas. Uh, which is about 3,000 nautical miles. And for those of you who don't know, a nautical mile is just a little bit longer uh, than, a, than a mile. Um, so the good news is Marquesas has a volcano that's 4,000 feet tall, so you can see it from 80 nautical miles away. So, you know, pretty good chance of seeing it. But if you're off by just two degrees over that distance, you're going to miss it by over 100 nautical miles. So you will pass it and not even realize that it's gone. You won't have seen it. And I hope you like saltines because that's all you're going to eat until you hit the Sydney Opera House in 6,800 nautical miles. So a lot of people say, well, why bother? Uh, you know, I've got a phone here that tells me exactly where I am to six feet. I've got a great GPS chart plotter. Uh, I don't need to know this. Um, but, you know, shit does happen. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> electronics don't always work. And I don't know this guy, but I know guys that this has happened to. And they've been out at sea, and they've gotten hit by lightning. All their electronics have been fried. Um, people have spare, uh, spare GPS, handheld GPSs, but batteries go flat. Electronics don't work. And you better have a way as to use as a backup uh, when things go wrong. All right, as promised, some giants. All right, you can't talk about navigation without talking about the Polynesians. Um, they used uh, a very clever combination of celestial navigation, uh, wave patterns, bird migration even, uh, watching to see where the birds, what directions they flew at the end of the season and thinking, hmm, wonder where they're going. Um, I'm not going to talk about this anymore because we have Juliet in the audience. If you could just put your hand up. <laughs> uh, Juliet has her PhD in uh, uh, early navigation, and if anybody would you like to talk about it, she's the person, not me. Uh, of course, the early European explorers. 
Uh, as mentioned earlier, they knew where latitude was. They didn't know where longitude was. So they used a method called dead reckoning, uh, which basically means, okay, I know where I am here. I can see land. I have a defined spot. I know my compass heading. I know my speed. I know I'm going at that speed for six hours. And then they can estimate where their new position is based on assumed knowledge of currents and windage and things like that. If you're going across the Atlantic, you're contending with this guy here, uh, Gulf Stream, zipping along at an average speed of four knots. So good luck using dead reckoning. Uh, it's amazing they got here, that they got home. Uh, it's a minor miracle. All right, back to the chronometer. Um, this guy, John Harrison, he's the inventor of it. And um, so, in 1707, there was uh, this very tragic event called the Scilly Naval Disaster, where uh, I forget if it was three or four British ships went down after an operation in France, and they estimate somewhere between 1,600 to 2,000 sailors lost their lives in this, uh, in this shipwreck. Uh, it happened just off the south coast of the UK. The reason it happened is because they didn't know where they were. There was no accurate way to determine their location. So a few years later, uh, Parliament institutes something called the Longitude Act. And this was a prize, a uh, 10,000 pounds sterling, for anybody who could determine longitude to an accuracy of 60 nautical miles. So not a very high bar. Uh, with the sextant that I have uh, and a super accurate watch, I can now get it down to about five nautical miles, so still not great. You're not going to use it to navigate a ship channel at night, but it gives you the big picture. So this is the guy that won the prize by inventing the chronometer and correlating longitude with time. And if you're even a little bit interested in this, I highly recommend this book called Longitude uh, by Deva Sobel. It's a real interesting read. It's, it's quite short. You can get the ebook on Amazon or hard copy. Uh, it's, it's really quite good. Uh, this rather dour looking man uh, is Thomas Sumner. He's the one that figured out the line of position that we talked about earlier. Uh, even today, it's called a, a Sumner line. When people talk about lines of position, they talk about Sumner lines. A very camera shy Marc St. Hilaire, a Frenchman who I couldn't find any photos of, uh, came up with the intercept method. And we didn't get into some of the math on the longitude section, uh, but it's basically a way of comparing the altitude of an object uh, that you observe versus what it should be in the nautical almanac comparing the two and figuring out where your line of position is from that. Like how they came up with this stuff is just mind blowing. So just uh, some kind of cool modern applications. Uh, my favorite airplane, the uh, SR-71A Blackbird, uh, designed in the 50s by Lockheed Skunk Works division um, over Mach 3, it's still the fastest airplane in the world. Um, designed in the 50s, it flew in the 60s through the 90s, and uh, it used celestial navigation to, uh, to let the pilot know where it was. Uh, this funny looking box here uh, was a big telescope that was mounted just behind the cockpit, and in real time it told the pilot where he was flying. Uh, the early uh, 747s, that's the Boeing 747-100 series. Uh, it actually came with a sextant port for the navigator to use to plot their position as they trekked across the Atlantic or Pacific. Uh, I'm sure everybody recognized the Earthrise photo taken by the astronauts in Apollo 8. Uh, Jim Lovell was the commander on that, and uh, whilst they used uh, navigational guidance, sorry, inertial navigation for their primary way of figuring out where they were, um, they had to recalibrate the machine twice a day. And so twice a day, Jim Lovell would pull up to his sextant and enter into the computer all the corrections and 
got them to the moon and back. And they actually lost, they screwed up their computer halfway through their return journey. And it was only through celestial navigation that they were able to make it back. And then uh, our little Mars rover there, you know, there's no GPS on Mars. Um, how do you think they know where they are? It's, uh, <laughs> they use celestial navigation uh, still today for all sorts of space exploration. Um, lastly, just a, a quick note I just made to myself. The U.S. Naval Academy, it stopped teaching celestial navigation in the late 90s. And somewhat more recently, you know, post 9-11 world, they reinstituted it in 2015. So if you talk to uh, a Naval Academy grad today, they will have taken celestial navigation. It's a requirement to, uh, uh, to, to graduate from the U.S. Naval Academy. Uh, concerns about electronic failures, terrorism, taking down GPS satellites. They want to make sure they have a backup plan uh, when they're at sea. All right, so now what? Uh, my training's completed. As Paul mentioned, I've uh, earned my Yacht Master certification. I practice every chance I get, which isn't all that often in Boulder, unfortunately. <laughs> my son Jake graduates high school in a few more years, that, so that should free up some time for this. My wife Jody, she's agreed to join for select legs at select latitudes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm still very much in awe of giants. So. If anybody would like some free skippering, uh, whether it's uh, a day sail out on Lake Dillon or a trip to the Caribbean, I'd be happy to join <laughs> and uh, happy to tell you what I can and what, uh, you know, some, try to let you know some of the things that I've learned along the way. So thank you very much for listening. Any questions? John, one of the things that you had on the screen, John, that was just mind-boggling to me, you even put, how in the world did they get all that data in the almanac for any point on the Earth, this is where you're at? I mean, did they have people just cruising around figuring that out? I mean, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's mind-blowing when you think about it. And so I, I mentioned it's, it's 57 stars. That part is not all that impressive because if you know the position of one star, you know the position of every star in the night sky. So you only have to know one star and then the four planets, the sun and the moon. And so you have to know their orbit. And this guy in 1767, when you know, the king said, go to your royal observatory and spend the next however many years they did it, watching all these objects cross the sky. And they came up with these tables, and then they came up with this geometry to be able to, what they call, reduce a sight, and figure out, okay, well, we know where that position was over Greenwich, so that using some trigonometry, we're able to figure out where, what that object should look like when you're in the middle of the South Pacific. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Time for one more. Uh, it was about a four-year program, uh, sort of a combination of uh, the C time, uh, the some classroom time, uh, but it's mostly practical. And then the final exam is a one-week exam with, uh, uh, with an instructor on, on the ocean, and, and you, you, know, you do all sorts of things while you're out there for the week. John, yeah. thank you so much. What a wonderful mm. adventure. And clearly, lots of folks would love to uh, pick your brain and <laughs> learn a little bit more about this, maybe uh, after the meeting today. But thank you so much for sharing this with us. And of course, mm. uh, Boulder Rotary, as a thank you, will be making uh, 100 donations of polio vaccine uh, in your honor. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.